talk about clarity in marketing, how clarity is so important. Absolutely. And um, we had none. We were just custom bespoking everything. What I didn't do was productize. And that becomes A, a really long sales process. Yes. <laughs> um, B, really hard to deliver. The value that we gave was really good. But of course, I couldn't articulate the value up front. I was just charging ridiculous pricing, ridiculously yeah. low because I wasn't clear on my own value and the impact it could have. Welcome to Getting to the Heart of Business, brought to you by The Online Co, where we believe the best way to help small and medium businesses grow is by putting people first. I'm James Parnwell, and in this episode, we interview Vanessa Main from Loft Inc. Loft Inc is an educational business designed to help salon owners in the beauty industry grow their business and improve their profitability. Vanessa's story actually started in the corporate world right back in the Sydney Olympics. So my co-host and marketing pro is Jess Caluso. Hey Jess. Hey James. Where were you in the Sydney Olympics? Where was I? I was about 12 years old. I was in year six okay. at, at primary school. And uh, what's your best memory of the Olympics? I've got two really good ones. Yep. So the first one is I remember, so in year six, you have this sort of end of year awards presentation sort of ceremony. And I remember I received the award for sports person of the year. Well done. And, uh, yeah, I, I can't remember. Who, oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I can't remember who presented it to me. You know, it must have been like the principal of the local high school or something like that. And I specifically remember them saying, well done, sports person of the year in the Olympic year. You know, and as a 12 year old, I, I imagined one day I was going, going to be in the Olympics. Yeah. Probably my fondest memory, though, of the Olympics is actually going to uh, one of the hockey games or yeah. one of the hockey sessions. So you sessions. were a hockey player. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I used, that was your used to play field hockey. Yeah. yeah. And so we got, we got these tickets and we went to, it was a men's session. We're watching some other countries. I don't know, not Australia. I don't remember who they are specifically, but the only country I do remember is Poland. Okay. It was the first experience my family had really ever had of like Europeans chanting at sport. Right. There was this let's go they Poland. Do it so well, yeah. Don't they? they were yeah. just they were right into it. And I think they were, you know, they were playing a powerhouse of hockey. It was like an Indian team, something like that. They're yeah, just phenomenal team. Yeah. men's team. And you know, the crowd was into it. It was fantastic. It was great hockey. But what really made the atmosphere was it started to rain. Right. And it started to just rain so heavily. So it's pouring down the game was like nail biting it was so close game finishes I think whoever won they they won in like the last two minutes or yeah. something like that it was cra- yeah crowd was going crazy and it was just like you know as a 12 year old kid I'm thinking this is unbelievable yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do this one day <laughs> got on the train home soaking wet oh we were drenched we got on the train back home I remember my my grandfather picked us up and he had blankets and towels and everything because we were freezing but yeah what an experience the olympics was so vanessa spent uh her, the entire olympic period there she actually slept in her office that's um, incredible yeah <laughs> so the, the beauty industry is one that's undergone a massive change in the last 20 years day spas and wellness retreats are commonplace now but back in the early 2000s they were only just emerging in australia Vanessa Main was in charge of one of the very first resort spas in the country and it was on Hayman Island, of all places. And as the industry exploded, it took her on an incredible journey all around the world. One of the things I love most about the podcast is hearing the fascinating ways people come to be running their business. Often the path is unexpected, accidental and unconventional. Vanessa Main is one of those people. She's the founder and director of Loft Inc., an education consulting business to the beauty, wellness and day spa industry. The journey of how she got here is fascinating and surprising. And the principles she now teaches to beauty and wellness leaders are things that you can apply to your own business. She's with me now. Vanessa, welcome to the podcast. Hi, James. Thanks for having me. So there's quite a story to how you got into the beauty and wellness industry. It wasn't the traditional route. So can you take us back to the start? 
Uh, yeah, no, it wasn't the traditional route. My very first job was in a health food shop. Okay. So I've always been interested in kind of health, wellness. And I used to play um, a huge amount of uh, high level sport. I played basketball, I played netball, I ran, I swam, um, I did, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. So when I was at school, I convinced myself that I'll do exercise science. That was really what I wanted yeah. to do. But it was a new degree. So there wasn't a lot of spaces. Okay. And um, I played sport all through my HSC. So the only thing I studied for was two unit health and yep, PE. The thing you loved, yep. I came in the top 2% of the state for that and everything else miserably down the other end. So I think my (laughs) TR was like 55. My mum had enrolled me in business college without me knowing as a backup (laughs) because she obviously identified that I wasn't studying (laughs) and I wasn't doing very well. And business college is not really my thing. It was like a straight skirt, high heels, travel on the train to the city, shorthand, you know, all of that. that. Not me at all. I lasted three weeks and I would do anything I could to get out of it. So I actually ended up enrolling in nursing at uni because it was the only thing I could really get into. And so I did a year of nursing and I actually really enjoyed it. I got like a distinction average. And um, at the end of that year, I got an offer to go and do exercise science. So I ended up doing a double degree, uh, exercise science, public health. And while I was there, one of the subjects I really loved was sports rehabilitation. Okay. And um, I took myself off and studied massage, you know, at night. I really started my own business back then, not that I ever looked at it like that, but I was doing mobile massage. So okay. I go to people's homes and massage and I was massaging sports teams and things like that. I actually really loved it. When I finished uni, I started working at, you know, like the health funds, like MBF, they yeah. had corporate wellness facilities back then. Okay. And I was working at one in Kent Street in the city, in Sydney. And um, my boss said to me, how would you like to go to Hayman Island? Because they managed the kind of fitness and activities yeah. part. I think he called me about 8 o'clock in the morning and by 8.30 I'd signed contracts and I was on my way to Hayman <laughs> Island. <laughs> think about it. Do I want to go to a tropical <laughs> island or not? Yeah. And it was funny because I was living with my mum and dad at the time and um, my mum and dad actually honeymooned on Hayman Island. Wow. So it was quite full circle. Yeah. But that entered me into, you know, hotels, resorts and the start of a journey in spa okay and you developed one of the first day spas in australia yeah so what happened was after my first stint on hayman i i wanted to come back and use my degree so i came back to sydney and it was in the lead up to the 2000 sydney olympics so it was about 98 and socog offered me a secondment and so i went and worked for them during the games and I slept in my office in Homebush um, <laughs> and I looked after a whole bunch of volunteers. So for the whole Sydney Olympics, slept under your desk, did you? Yeah, I actually took a mattress in, <laughs> yeah. slept on the floor <laughs> never left. Um, for the Olympics and the Paralympics because it was just too hard oh, to okay. get in and out. And we worked such big days. Yeah. But I was young. I mean, I was 25 or something when that was going on and I had like 1,500 volunteers. But I met some of the most amazing people. Yeah, that bet. just made it the best experience of my life. After that, I got a phone call from a headhunter recruitment. They offered me a role to go back to Hayman and what it was was about integrating fitness with beauty and hair um, and the massage component. And I went back as the manager and I did that. And that was really one of the first spas in Australia. It was when it was all starting to happen. And that movement or that industry started to develop really massively in hotels and hospitality. And I just fell into it. I worked with P&O Resorts in Australia. So Lizard Island, Brampton, Badara, uh, Heron Island, Cradle Mountain in Tassie. And then we launched um, Chuan Spa Concept for Langham Hotels, which was uh, we launched in Melbourne and Hong Kong. And then I lived overseas for 10 years. So I lived in the Maldives for about two years. And then Jeez, I... you've lived in some rough places. Yeah. Hayden, <laughs> Maldives. <laughs> I, I kind of got spoiled from a hotel perspective. Yeah. And Maldives, you'd think it was the best job of your life. My friends used to say to me, you work in spa and you live in the Maldives. Like, could it be any better? <laughs> But it was actually one of the toughest jobs of my life. I think it was probably one of my biggest learning grounds. So a beautiful environment. I didn't enjoy it as much as what you would probably think, but looking back, I learned so much. Mm. And then I spent six years in Singapore with Hilton. Okay. And then I guess you've got to the point of saying, oh, I think I'd like to 
wind this up? Yeah, it was interesting because I, I just said to myself, whenever it's time to go, I'll just honour that and go. And um, I woke up one day in Singapore and I was just like, I'm just, I'm ready to go back to Australia. You know, I'm just done with the travel. We would do three countries in a week. Yeah. And it was a big job. And we had China and India in our region, which were just going gangbusters in terms of development. So it was massive and crazy. Um, and so I remember one day I just resigned. And hotels are very male-dominated industry and spas are very female-dominated industry. So when I first started with them, the commercial aspect, like they, it was just a bit of fluff. It was just a guest service. It's an amenity we have to offer. You know, we don't make money out of it. And so they were quite dismissive. It was okay. pretty hard as a female going in and trying to get that airtime with them. Um, I changed my language and really kind of... Um, and I'm not super fluffy, so I was able to kind of, I guess, talk that language. But in the end, I mean, we had some locations where spa was more profitable than some of the food and beverage, uh, right. which is, you know, kind of crazy. So when the numbers so that, started to stack... To, they had to notice, yeah. And I think when I left, they were sort of like, what are we going to do? Uh, <laughs> so they actually let me go back to Australia, keep my job, and which was a bit unheard of for a big organisation like that. Uh, and so I returned to Sydney at the end of 2012. I worked with Hilton at the end of 2012 and 2013 and it didn't really work mm. um, because I wanted balance and, you know, I was still travelling and still okay. doing calls at, you know, midnight because we were with the US. And so I left and I took a long sabbatical. Yeah, so you just rested? Yeah, I had um, eight weeks in Europe, renovated an apartment that I'd bought. I threw my sister a really massive 40th birthday, just Lovely. hung out with friends. And it, I was surprised how long it took me to decompress from that role. Yeah, wow. It's interesting that you live under pressure and possibly don't even realise it till you get out from under it. And yeah, and I think it's that chronic pressure and it develops over time. My life yeah. was busy and fast-paced and when you travel... Um, it's not that great on your well-being either because you don't no. sleep properly and, you know, you don't eat properly. And you, every hotel you went to, like the GMs wanted to really showcase their property to you as well because they wanted you to do great things for them. Mm. Um, so they would, you know, let's go and eat dinner and let me host you and, you know, yeah. wine and all those sorts of things. And in the end, I, I used to just say to them, and I was lucky because I could get away with this, I'm trialling a new detox product. <laughs> and I'm not drinking and I just need clean food. And they would never question it because of what I was doing. They'd be like, oh, tell me about no, it. It's a, it's a good way around it. So sabbatical is a beautiful thing. I um, took one a few years ago and Valerie Ling that we interviewed on a previous episode, she's on one at the moment. And, and often out of the space that you create, like new things are born. And, and the whole idea for Loft was born during a sabbatical. Yeah, and I think um, the biggest thing when you're in it and working is that you lose the imagination and the creativity it can get really kind yeah. of quashed and for me I'd lost that because I was it's almost becomes a bit transactional you know yeah, every day the daily grind really means something doesn't it? you're just grinding away yeah so yeah loft really was born in that time and it was just born through conversation I got quite a few job offers but they were all back overseas and I just didn't want to do that yeah. again and so in having conversations with business owners and um, finding out kind of what the problems were. And in Australia at that time, the bigger part of the industry was kind of what we would term like the beauty kind of salon hair industry, if you like, that was more standalone businesses. So independent yep. business owners um, was a much bigger market segment than the traditional day spa or resort spa market that's in hotels. So they were the people that I started having conversations with. And I'm just such a giver. I love sharing knowledge. So I would just have conversations and talk to people and through talking to them and kind of starting to solve some problems for them, I was like, hmm, actually, maybe there's something in this because I really loved yeah. that we were helping. And um, they were really positive about what they were kind of getting out of it. So all your experience all over the world in all these different spaces, you'd kind of seen everything, seen all the problems, and so you could just offer them advice? Yeah, and I think what I did, which I didn't know at the time, and it took me quite a while to realise, is that through my roles, uh, because they were so big, I had to create ways to drive efficiency. 
So I created frameworks okay. and models and ways to analyse things that helped me in my roles. And I didn't realise how many I'd actually created and how impactful they are. So it's that part of Loft, which is the cornerstone. It's not just advice and advisory and we'll talk to you about these things. It's then actually we can get down in the weeds with you and help you yeah. implement it. But also there's some real benchmarking that goes on behind it and there's some real analysis and we give them tools that actually help them to kind of really see yeah. visibility of their business. And I look at some of the tools and people give us feedback on them all the time and even my team say, like, this is phenomenal, Vanessa. When did you create it? And I'm like, I actually don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe 15 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and I think sometimes those things just evolve, right? So yeah. there's never a finish date on them. But, yeah, that's what really kind of started happening. Yeah. So tell me about LOFT. So LOFT is an acronym that stands for Leverage, Optimise, Focus, Thrive. That's really the process that we take them through. So looking at all those aspects of their business. Yeah, so what's the leverage step? So leverage is looking at what assets do they have at the moment and how do we leverage them better. It could be brand, it could be team, it could be you're sitting on something here that's gold but you're just not leveraging okay. that enough. So um, it could be any part of the business. So what's, could be the what's good bus- in your business and yeah, how can you make more out of absolutely. that? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, industry and market can be very noisy Mm. and so sometimes we're led down the path because of the voices that say you should do this and you should do that and it's it's very loud and the way that we approach it is we can grow a business any way you like at the end of the day you have to love your business as a business owner when you don't have any joy or love for your business we don't show up very well no um and so we can grow it any way you like if you want to you know, mix skin with beauty and with spa, like go for it. As long as there's a market, as long as there's a consumer market and we can build that, do what you love and what you're passionate about. So once you've identified those those strengths, I guess, then you start to optimise them. Yep. So looking for efficiencies and it doesn't go in order. So they're the four, they're the four parts that we work across, but we might look at a business and go, look, you're leveraging really well, but you really need to optimize for efficiency. So it could be about automation. It might be about delegating from a business owner point of view, let's eliminate or delegate some tasks um, to free some time. It could be optimizing the service part of their business or, you know, online or retail or, you know, any of those things. So It doesn't really go in order. We give it to you in the order that you need. Yes. Uh, But those three things, leverage, optimization, and the focus, we need all of those to be able to make a business thrive. So I'm asking you these in detail because the principles are the same, you know, whether you're in trades or professional services, the principles still apply. So can you unpack focus a bit for us? Yeah, so focus is about financials. It's around getting super clear on what you need to focus on, but so many businesses don't measure and you can't improve, you know, what you don't measure. measure, That's correct. And they don't often know what to measure. So it's either I'm not quite sure what I should be measuring or looking at, so I just don't look at it. Or... Yes, which is scary. Really scary. Yeah. Or the second part is... um, I kind of have been taught what to measure, but I don't know what actions to take in my business that will actually make a change on that. Okay. And so it's when you link those two together and make it really simple that people start to understand what that's about. And most people, as a business owner, you come from a trade or you come from your craft. So you're really passionate about it, whether you're a carpenter, a beauty therapist, that's where you come from. You, you love your craft and you then just end up being a business owner. But no one really trains you on how to be a business owner. No, that's true. So you get an accountant that will do your P&L once a year or your taxes. So there's a compliance piece that we tick. But often we don't use those metrics or have visibility of what we need. So then what we find is business owners run around going, we, I've got a thousand things on my to-do list and I need to get more clients in the door. And I'm focused on all these things that, that uh, you know, take a lot of time and a lot of energy and I'm chaotic, but they don't actually yield the result. Yeah, gotcha. And so if we, when we really break it down, there's four ways you can grow a business, that's it. You can get more clients, you can increase the frequency of, you know, clients visiting you or yep. how often they spend with you, or you can increase the amount that they spend with you. They're the three front end things last one is the back end tighten your expenses or review that but it always comes back to being one of those and so 
often we'll say to, to businesses, look, you're focusing all on trying to get new clients in the door, but it's a noisy market. You're not getting cut through. If we actually just took this part of your database and got them to come one more time yeah. and you got them to spend $10 more with you, yeah. this is the difference it does to your numbers. And it's mind-blowing. Yeah, a lot less work. Customers that already like you, you're just helping them with another service. And I think it's about giving some tangible, this is how I do it. You know, so right, yes. th- th- it just becomes the... Not the just rah, rah, you can do it. It's when I fire up my computer at 9am on a Monday morning, what am I going to do? Like, yeah. <laughs> and it's also about like um, being able to talk the language, I think makes a difference. And particularly for this industry, and it was really interesting because it does relate to any industry. And I had a client that had amazing results with us and um, she rang me and she said... I've got a friend and they've seen what my business is doing and they're really interested to talk to you. But do you do other businesses? They're a butcher. Okay. And I was like, well, I don't really do butchers at the moment, (laughs) but, you know, and we talked and I did help them and we applied the same principles and their business went through the roof. So it's relatable to any industry. It's just for me... You don't want to, I don't want to ever become generic. I don't want to be one of those businesses that talks to everyone but doesn't really drive the change. Yeah. I would rather go, well, we focus in this area and we make a massive difference. Like impact's yeah. really important for Absolutely. me. Absolutely. So it's about really kind of let's get rid of all the noise and just bring it right, you know, back so that you're very focused. Uh, and what that does is decrease the overwhelm. When I speak with small and medium business owners... I generally find that they don't really know what their competitors are up to. I wonder if you've ever taken the time to analyse the competitive landscape of your industry. When we do this for clients, we typically find either there's a hero out there, somebody who has taken the time to craft their message, think through their overall strategy and is executing it awesomely and they are probably dominating your market. The second thing we find is that nobody's really picked up the act. That gives you a real opportunity to be the hero straight up. You're probably in one of those places where you can look at that hero and take some ideas from what they're doing. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. Or alternatively, you can get out there ahead of the pack. This is just one of the ideas we talk about in our digital marketing playbook. If you feel that this would be helpful for your business, please feel free to book a quick chat at theonlineco.net. So I'll just repeat those. Uh, Loft is leverage, optimize, focus, and the last one is thrive. And am I assuming that's the outcome of getting the first three right? Yeah, no, thriving is actually one of the the pillars that we focus on. So what Thrive is all about is making sure that um, you're looking after yourself personally. Mm. So energy, mindset, how you're sort of leading the team, communication, those things have to be in place for you to be able to have, you know, a thriving, energetic, productive business. So those four things tie together the outcome Uh, we use loft as well which is about learning an opportunity delivers freedom and transformation and that's what we're really about and transformation we can measure stats and all those things and we do that with businesses and when they do our program we can see this is all the change that's happened it's all very tangible but why I do what I do is because of the intangible benefit and that is the change in the person. Yeah. It's the confidence, it's the, their mindset, it's the comments and the feedback of, I get to spend more time with my kids. Yeah, You've changed right. my life. You yeah. know, um, I thought I was going to get divorced and now we're happier than ever. Um, we've just bought our first house and we've been trying to do it for years and the business has allowed us to do that. All that stuff is really why we do it. So it's the transformation of people Mm. and the impact on people's lives. It's wonderful. It took you a while, though, to get to the point of being able to really clarify your products and make your business viable. Tell us about that journey. Well, (laughs) talking to you as a marketing expert, (laughs) um, one of the things that you would uh, probably be amazing at and tell me to do straight away is, you know, productize. (laughs) I was terrible. Um, and I think, A, I never set out to be a business owner. Yeah, I fell into it by accident. That and happens that, to so many people we speak to. It's, it's such crazy, a common isn't it? thing. Yeah. So at the start of my journey with Loft, it was just me. And, um, you know, you become everything. Your HR, your finance, you know, <laughs> you're everything. All the operations, <laughs> um, everything. Customer management. Delivery. Yeah, yeah, yeah Marketing, everything. sales, a lot. 
and I did so much of it so badly. It's so it's so funny. I look back now and I'm like, um, gosh, you would you know do it so differently with what you know. Yeah. Um, but. I had so much to offer, I think, the breadth of what it was and the problems that were arising. I was like, yeah, we can fix that. Yes, we can fix that. And so what I didn't do was productize. And there was two really big impacts for that. One, I made it really hard for my customer to buy. Yes. Because how, how do you define what you what you do? And the second was I didn't put any boundaries around my own well-being. Okay. And that were two big impacts. Very hard to grow a business when you're doing those things. So we talk about clarity in marketing, how clarity is so important. And um, when you say, I'm going to help you grow your business, well, it's quite a fuzzy statement, isn't it? Um, but if you say, well, we help your business through this four-step program and, and it starts at this price, then you start to build a lot of clarity about it. People can see what's involved and then they can decide yes or no. But prior to that, they're confused by lack of clarity. Absolutely. Um, we had none. I, 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 had, I had absolutely none for myself and it was like you would get these inquiries and everything was word of mouth. We didn't do any marketing. I, we've just been terrible at that whole marketing function and, and we didn't do it for a long time. Um, in fact, I don't think we've ever done it well. But when people would call and they would be like, I want to give you money, I want to work with you, we were just custom bespoking everything. Yeah. And that becomes, A, a really long sales process. Yes. <laughs> um, B, really hard to deliver because, you know, everything, yeah. you're not driving any kind of efficiency. And we were just jumping. We didn't do anything, you know, really well. It was We were very customer-centric. And the value that we gave and the knowledge and the insight and everything else was really good. But, of course, I couldn't articulate the value up front because I didn't really have clarity on what we were selling. Yeah. I was just charging ridiculous pricing. Like, it was just like I was giving myself away. Yeah, when you say ridiculous, you're saying ridiculously low. Oh, ridiculously yeah. low. Not valuing your... Oh, my goodness, the, no. Yeah, your, your service, which is really common as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's another thing that comes up. Oh, I just didn't feel like I should charge my time. But when you're in your job, you were getting paid per hour, fairly, I assume. And... Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's really, it, well, no, it's, it's really interesting because I, I have absolutely, I had some great jobs and some big salaries and all of those things. And um, it seems great on the surface. Then when you work out all the hours that you work all the overtime, and yeah, all those yeah, things, yeah. it's like, hmm, actually. The, the, the hourly rate goes down. Yeah, but yeah. when you're in business, it, I don't know, there's a shift to, oh, now I'm charging. Like it's a bit of a step for people. And I think the cornerstone of that, and I think a lot of people struggle with this, and I really did, uh, is your own self-worth, right? Yep. It's about valuing yourself and what you have to offer. And I have had a long history of the way I derive my value is by doing for other people. Yeah. And so when I'm in a job, I'm I'm an, one of a phenomenal employee because I always go above and beyond. I always want to do a good job. And it's almost how you earn your value. And when I went into this business, the employer really became my clients. And so I was then doing that for them. Okay. I, I went above and beyond. I would over deliver and I would undercharge because I wasn't clear on my own value and the impact it could have. And over time with this business, I've become really clear on that. And I've done a lot of work on myself too around, around those sorts of things. And you start to be able to go... If we work with you like this, these are the results you'll expect to see. This is a fair price for that. Yes. And it becomes much clearer in terms of being able to articulate what people will get out of that, uh, but also what the expectation is for delivery. Yeah. So once you get staff on, productization is really important because then they can follow the steps. And there can be flexibility, so it's not like everybody, you're cookie-cuttering everything. You just have process, and within the process is the bespoke pieces, but your staff can do it. And then you're talking about not charging enough, and I guess once you've got staff, they have a cost, like they're costing you an hourly rate, and then there's the expenses on top of that. And you've got to make a margin on top, and if you're not charging that amount, you might be losing money on doing the service, so you, just, you start turning work down because it's just... Yeah. I'm essentially paying to do this. And you end up being the person that does everything. So you're doing all the delivery, you know, and, and almost in the lead up to getting team on board before you take that step. It's like you're almost 
over, you know, fill yourself. But yeah, I mean, and I made some massive mistakes with Jane. <laughs> Huge. Yeah, do you mind sharing some of <laughs> some of the yeah. things? How long have we got? Well, <laughs> well, what's beautiful about this is that people can learn from our mistakes. We we've made mistakes too, absolutely. And mm. hiring people is maybe the most complex part of business. People are complicated, and uh, meeting them and trying to see if they're a fit is yeah. difficult. Definitely. You know, for me, a lot of the mistakes that I made up front was when I felt really overwhelmed, I was strapped for time and I wasn't able to make enough money to really kind of go, this is kind of all worth it. So when you start to then bring team on, for me, I try to replace myself. What I was looking at was where I was spending my time, which was in the doing, so it was in the delivery. And I almost just absorbed all the other stuff of running okay. the business, you know, the marketing, the finance, all that. I just kind of absorbed that, that that was my responsibility because I'm a business owner. So I went about trying to replace myself in the delivery mechanism. But I was just employing people and setting them up to fail because we had no infrastructure in the business. I had no systems, I didn't have stuff built for them. So even if they could deliver, uh, they didn't have the right support. So what happened for me is that team became a bigger burden. Okay, it's just more work for you. (laughs) Absolutely, and so then I would get frustrated and I would be like, I'm paying all these people and like it's harder, (laughs) what's going on? And now I've changed my recruitment process. So um, I hire really slowly. Um, So that's terrific advice. Yeah, and I do it in four steps, and I think they're really important steps, and I would never change this now. So the first one is I often don't advertise. I will always ask people for referrals, and I'll go to lots of different networks, and I'll often go to even local community, like Facebook groups and other things. But the steps that I go through is the first one, I always have a phone call with them first. And the reason I do that is because I get to see how they are on the phone. So how they answer the phone, how they interact with me, how easy is it to communicate and it just breaks the ice Mm. and it's a good 20 minutes and then I will profile them. I get them to do a profile like Myers-Briggs, like a 16 personalities kind of profile and I get them to do DISC as well because that gives me some insight into how they are and where they're kind of coming from. Then I meet with them in person. I'll normally meet with them at least twice. So the first time I'll normally have two hours with them. So two hours is a long time. What are are you doing in the two hours? I'm asking a lot of questions. I don't do a lot of talking. They do a lot of talking. Um, And really what I'm asking is, you know, tell me a time when this happened or if something like this goes on, how does it make you feel? Uh, None of the questions that I'm asking are directly task related. They're about attitude, behaviour. What I'm looking at is I'm looking at resilience. I'm looking at how do you work under pressure? How do you deal with conflict? Um, How do you like to be managed? Where does your information come from? Because if I ask questions around tasks, most likely people will go, yes, I can do that. And I think for me, I never go into a job interview or recruit for my team with a job description. I build the job description around the person. Right. I know the core function in the role that I want to get covered. But what I do want to do is make sure I'm maximising everything that that person can offer me. But also, A, because my business will benefit, but B, they will love their job so much more. And what I want is a team that just loves showing up to work every day because they'll do so much more for me. But more than that, they'll serve my clients the very best way that they can. Yes. And that's really important. So it's really about, I want to understand them. And then I do another profile with them called uh, Wealth Dynamics, which is a really interesting one and it's about flow. Uh, And that's really about setting them up for success. And what I found is that a lot of the mistakes I made was because I didn't have any of the support mechanisms that I really needed in the business. I was trying to replace myself and I would normally go for personalities like myself. Okay. And most of the time in business, a business owner needs opposites. Yes. <laughs> but you don't always have the best conversations sometimes with them or you yep. don't have all those ideas and the banter. And and so when I started to open up my mind to that, it totally changed. And now... And this I, profile... These profiling tools are really uncovering the things that you, from your perspective and your personality, don't, can't see and possibly don't understand. Yes. Yeah, so it's about setting me up for success, but yeah. it's also about setting them up for success because the things that I don't love doing and I'm not great at doing, 
you know, you can be capable, but if you don't love doing it, right, you'll be slow. They're all the things I procrastinate on. They're the things I leave to the last minute. So what I want is someone that loves that. I want them to show up to work and they just love doing those things all day, every day. I don't want them to feel like I do, which is I don't really love doing it, but I can. I want them to go, this sets right. my world on fire. Yeah. And now that I have that, they're super efficient. They make my life so much easier. And they get to feel like they show up and make a massive contribution because yeah. they do. Yeah, and it's awesome. One of the jobs, <laughs> we do monthly reports for yep. all of our clients to put together monthly reports. And it was one of the jobs that I just really hated. Every And the month comes around so fast, you've got to do it again. But Heidi, who works for us, loves monthly reports. And so you can hire people but love the things that you hate. How wonderful is that? I know. <laughs> what I'm a like, gift. Uh, I've got Amy in my business now and like she loves systems. Yep. And she loves organisation. And so I'm like, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. This is. I just now go, this is what I'm trying to achieve. I just yeah. want to get there the most efficient way, make it easy for clients, make it easy for us. However we do it, I'm totally okay. Yeah. We actually round each other out. It's beautiful. It's so good because yeah. you, you know, it, it is. And they grow and you grow. Yep. Um, but what it does is free time. And then you can actually invest that time back in them. And I think that's one of the biggest things as well with team is if you don't give them time, uh, they don't feel, you know, connected. It's so important that they have time with you. Even if it's not about doing task, but just time to hang out, to check in, to, yes. you know, to be together yep. uh, is just so important. Now, you mentioned before about self-care, about boundaries and making sure you're looking after yourself. What does that look like for you? I think I had to learn to say no. That was a big one for me because I just am this innately I come from a place of I want to help people. Yeah. So um, when I see people that, you know, come and they say I've got all these issues I want to help them but what I found that that meant is that I sometimes wanted it more than my clients did okay I wanted to fix their business more than they actually did so yeah. whilst they talked about it they weren't actually committed to the process and so then if I want it more than them it makes it you know really hard to kind of deliver that because uh, they need to show up so I had to put some boundaries in place where I could ascertain how much they really wanted it. And if they were committed to the process, absolutely, we'll do that. So that meant saying no. Um, there was also things like I had to really kind of put some boundaries around my time. Um, and I had to give myself some routine and routine of self-care that I don't compromise on. So exercise is really important for yeah. me. Um, and I find that it's often the first thing that I let go of. As soon as I get really busy and work demands are huge, I let go of it, Yeah. Uh, which is crazy. Yeah, it affects you physically, but it really affects mentally as well, doesn't it? Absolutely. And I have some of my best uh, ideas when I'm training. Right. And it's not even ideas, it's like I solve problems in my head when I'm training and it's because I'm, I just, like you said before, I just give my brain some time to think about something else and it kind of comes. It comes up with things on its own. <laughs> yeah, subconscious is amazing. I think as humans we're, we're pretty interesting because I think we feel like when I'm at work is when I need to work and when I'm not, it's almost like, well, that's my leisure time and what I've learned as a business owner is it's all interlinked. Sometimes when I'm in my leisure time, um, I have a great idea for work or something comes to me and I'm just in that zone and I go, do you know what? If I just spend two hours and bang this out, it's going to make my life so much easier next week and, and so I just balance it out. Yeah. But I was trying to compartmentalise for a while, yeah. which I think you do when you're in a job. Right. I think one of my biggest learnings around self-care was not feeling guilty if I took time off during the week. So um, yeah. if I take a day because I wake up and I go, do you know what? I'm actually just not in it today. Like, so I'm, I go to work, but then I'm not being productive. I've learned to kind of be able to go, go for a drive, get out of there, do a different activity, you know, take yourself into a different environment. Don't try and force it. And you actually end up getting a lot more done. You don't have to be sitting in your office to be productive. Right. And it's just allowed things to be, you know, a, a, a lot less pressure on myself. Well, that in itself is important, isn't it? That pressure and expectation you put on yourself almost stifles creativity and can kind of crush yourself. 
uh, in a way that you can work with ease or you can work with stress. You get in the work, same amount of work done, you might as well do it with ease. Yeah. But it's not always easy just to switch off the, no. off the pressure, is it? <laughs> no, it's not. It's the hardest thing. And I think when you feel stressed, it's also, it's hard to feel stressed and joyful at the same time. Oh, it's impossible, yeah. And so when you, and it's, I think it's really important that you feel joy for your business because that's how you you know show up for your clients and for your team and you know having some gratitude around different things and kind of practicing some of that is really important and for me like time to just quiet my mind like Mm. meditation and you know those sorts of things and I'm still probably not great but um you know it's I know that I'm so much better when I do it so it's about having the discipline you know to, to do that um, I'd like to ask you a marketing question. It might be, you know, what's the worst thing you did in marketing or what's, what's been successful? Oh, James, that's a whole podcast in itself. <laughs> yeah, it's not my strong point. Yeah. I mean, we've made lots of mistakes and, and I don't think we've ever marketed well uh, at all in the business. And we're fortunate because we're doing really well without that. So I look at it now and I go, now that we're getting that right, how much better is the business going to be? But I think one of the biggest mistakes that I made is that I tried to recruit marketing internally. As a business, you need so many different dimensions of marketing. There's the strategy, there's the tactical, there's the social, there's the website, there's the SEO, like the digital footprint has just changed the landscape of marketing. There's the creative, the graphic design, you know, all of that. There's so much. There might be 15 different specialties you need. Yeah. And I've just realised that I will never employ that role again uh, because you can never get what you need from one person. And often a small business, it's too expensive to have all those different specialties. But even if they say, yes, I can do that, they will spend their time where they naturally prefer, which is either creative, okay, you yeah. know, or yeah, tactical. Yeah. And so it's very hard sometimes to get a return. Now we just outsource that and it's about uh, working with people that have got all those specialties under one roof, like you do. Yeah. It's, and it's all being looked after by people that do that all day, every day. Because things change, like Facebook algorithm, all that kind yeah. of stuff. Like, oh my God, it's just like, and yeah. I'm, I don't know all of those things. And I want someone that hangs out on those channels all day, every day, that knows what they're doing, that can get me the best results. One of the big mistakes that I do see out there, and we find this a lot with our clients, is that people talk about what they do, not why people should buy it so it's about articulating value Mm. I think if you can articulate your value well it's much easier to get people's attention and that's about you know the outcome and what's in it for them not about what you do yes one of the one of the core concepts we start with is the hero of your business is not you it's Mm. your customer so so you need to be talking to them about them not about you you come along and help them it uh, takes a bit of humility to, to to adopt that but your marketing won't work if it's all about, we started our business in 1988 and we've grown to be across all these countries. You know, and people are like, I don't care. What yeah. do you sell? That's not relevant to me. Yeah. As they flick through their Facebook timeline at you know, mm. a fraction of a second. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, and I agree. And I think it's, um, I think sometimes when you haven't productized well, it's hard to articulate the value. So one of our learnings as we've now productized well, we are not a coaching business, we're an education business. We have set programs. They're 12 weeks, you start here, you finish there. These are all the things we'll cover. Yeah. You show up and do the work, I'll guarantee you the results. And if you show up and do the work and don't get the results, I'll refund your money. Yeah. It shows kind of confidence, but I can actually talk to the results that they'll get. Yeah. And so that's about them. It's about... It's about them. If you, yeah, the choice is it, yours. It's you can, clear and it's low risk, yeah. But if you're not clear on what you're selling, you know, or who your audience is, it's hard to articulate the value well. And I think that's a common mistake in marketing. Sometimes it's like the audience is too broad or we, yep. you know, we can sell to everyone. So we, we don't get clear enough. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Mm. And we had to learn that where it's like there's all these things that we can do but doesn't mean that we should spend time developing a product or, you know, delivering that. And people always ask you to do things and you might be able to, but it might not be great for your business. It might not be a great solution, might not be where you need to spend time and energy. And if you keep creating or keep trying to add, then it dilutes your focus. 
All right, so what's, what's the future hold for Loft? Amazing stuff. So over the last four months, we've refreshed all of our branding. We've built a brand new website. We've really defined our customer journey and we know exactly kind of where we want to go in the future. So we're kind of now growing, you know, in in lots of different ways. And we've got some new events that we're going to be offering sort of like some immersive retreats so that people can have maximum learning short duration i think that's what the audience are looking for now a short duration and really kind of soak it up that would be great and Sounds what i'm exciting. also really looking forward to is having a month off <laughs> I'm, I'm having a holiday which oh, is great wonderful yeah even better well thank you so much for joining us on the podcast that was vanessa main and the best place to find out more about her work is on instagram at loftinc.anz so jess Vanessa talked about not wanting to hire one person to do her digital marketing. She felt like she needed to have multiple people. Can you explain that and and the need for expertise? Yes, certainly. So I love this point that Vanessa made and that she recognised that, you know, in digital marketing that covers a lot of facets, right? We've got SEO, we've got Google Ads, we've got Facebook organic or social media organic rather, we've got paid social media, there's websites, there's a, there's a whole stack of things. So it's nearly impossible to find one person who is an expert at all of those areas, so each of those areas of digital marketing, they're, they're constantly changing. So like Google has its algorithm, which is updated constantly. Facebook is the same and, and all the different social media platforms and the be- best practice changes. So it, it's nearly impossible for one person to be across all of that in terms of staying up to date with that and then implementing that in a business at, at one time. You know, it's having specialist specialists in each of those areas is really advantageous it means that you're getting people who you know they are specialists they're experts in those areas they're doing the work they're staying up to date with what's happening yeah. you're, you're getting best practice you're going to get better results it's that's where it comes down to results it yeah. does it really I, does i mean picking on seo for example we have five different areas of seo one's technical which needs like a a web developer or a programmer. But then there's content, which needs someone who's good at writing, like a wordsmith. Yeah. Then there's local, which takes a bit of content writing and a bit of technical. And then there's backlinking, which is almost like a PR function. And then there's user experience, which is the design thing. Yeah, so there's just so many elements to it. There's five different <laughs> skills under SEO. Yeah. So if you're just going, oh, I'm going to get someone to do SEO, uh, if they're not competent across all those five areas, and generally they're not, and if they are, they're probably already employed. That's right. That's <laughs> um, right. Yeah, you, you, you're going to get an ordinary result. Yeah. One of the other things that she spoke about, and I really want to get your insights on this, James, is she, she said a comment, it was that she made it difficult for people to buy from her. Mm. And you think, what, what do you mean? Like you're in business. Of course you want people to buy from you. But I wonder if you could unpack that a little bit in terms of like yeah. how important it is to get some clarity and make it easy for people to buy yeah, from for you. Yeah, sure. So um, there's some research done back in 2014 and it basically came up with the fact that people come to your website and they give you 10 seconds and they're deciding whether to click back or not. And I think we've all done that, right? We've typed yeah, in definitely. running shoes and clicked on a result in Google and gone, oh, they're women's running shoes or they're kids' running shoes or, like, they're not the ones I'm looking for, clicked back and searched again. We've all done that, Oh, yeah, definitely. So the research said that was 10 seconds, and that's 2014, so seven years ago. I reckon it might be seven seconds. Yeah. It might even be four seconds now. That's not a lot of time for you to convince someone that they're in the right place. And we talk about the think, feel, do test. You've got to pass three hurdles to get people to stay. The first one is the think... And what people, the first thing they're doing is they're reading a piece of text. Mm. So if if you've typed in women's running shoes and you land on a page that just says running shoes, well, now you're a step away from what you just said. But if it says women's running shoes, people straight away think, oh, I'm in the right place. That's that's the frontal cortex, a part of their brain's gone, yes, and you get the first tick. The second one is the feel. And this has to do with the pictures on the website, the colours, the design, the styling. Because people want to buy from somewhere that feels nice. And, and possibly you've been into a shop 
It's a bit dark and dingy. And it might sell the shoes you want, but it doesn't feel nice. It hasn't got the right feel, does it? Yeah, and you're like, oh, restaurants particularly like this. You you Mm. might be wanting fish and chips for lunch. And you can see that shop and it says it's fish and chips and you walk up to it and it looks dirty and, and not very right. So you, then you go and find somewhere else because it doesn't feel right. It's a different part of the brain. Mm. So if, it, if it's designed nicely and says something clear, the next thing people are saying is, what's next? Mm. And so that's the do test. What do I need to do next? So you need to put what to do. Yeah. Do you need to, on our website it says book a quick chat. So you can just jump on, click on that, and we'll call you back. We'll have a five-minute chat. So that's the next thing to do. Now, people are not going to do that in the first 10 seconds. All you've flagged for them is, oh, there's a next step. And once they pass that 10 seconds, they'll then spend minutes. That 10 okay. seconds might go to 90 seconds, might go to 180 seconds, might go to 500 seconds. Wow, they, so if, if they pass that first ten, right. that 10 seconds, it's then just, you know, it goes exponential from there, isn't it? Yeah, pretty much. Well, think about the fish and chip shop. You give that 10 seconds before you walk out. But if you've decided you're going to have lunch there, well, then you're staying there a long time. You're going to order, get your drink, all that stuff. Right. So then your time on site improves, your bounce rate goes down. All the the good stuff happens. And you've now told people what it is you do and made it clear for them what the next step is. Yeah. I really like your point about the, the feel. I don't yeah. know if people listening have ever thought about the feel of your website and relating that to the f- like the feel of it when you're in a restaurant. It's so important. Yeah, it's such so a good people takeaway. spend tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands making their restaurants feel nice. Yeah. so it's a place you'd want to have a meal. On a website, you potentially just need a really nice hero shot. Okay, that ideally shows you working with your customer or yeah. your customer enjoying your product and. Like they're happy. Yeah. It, it doesn't need to be super complex. It just needs to speak to why they're there and potentially answer their problem. Yeah, okay. That's that's really good insight. So if you want to know more about that, you can jump on our website. Just go to the onlineco.net and in the little search bar, it's at the top right-hand corner, you can type in a 10-second assessment and it'll come up. You can read some more information about that. So coming up next week, if you ever feel like business is a tough gig, wait till you hear the story of Zidu. They're a brilliant company in Melbourne that does training in ultrasound techniques for the medical industry. You wouldn't expect in such a caring profession that you'd experience all kinds of opposition, but that's what happened for Sue Ann Pascoe and her husband Michael Duncan. They've had to rise above all kinds of challenges and they're a great example of how you can walk through a storm in business, come out the other side stronger and more focused than ever before. This episode of Getting to the Heart of Business was brought to you by The Online Co. Produced by Claire Bruce, music by Harry Parnwell. You can find us at theonlineco.net. If you've enjoyed this episode, please feel free to share it. Subscribe to our podcast, leave us a review, and we'd love for you to join us on our Facebook group, Getting to the Heart of Business community. Music.